opinions expressed in the following program are those of the producer and not necessarily those of WKTV Community Media. That's what you had me do. So, okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. How's everyone today? Well, I, my name is Josh Bernstein. I am a regional manager for KDL, managing uh, Granville here and one of our other branches. Just wanted to welcome everybody. We're really excited um, for today's event um, to be able to celebrate local authors and books and reading. Um, if you haven't been here before, please take a moment after to explore the building. We are blessed to be in a basically brand new building that just opened up. Well. Brand, brand new part of the building and brand new renovated building um, that just opened up in the last year. Um, we're blessed to have a, a city, a community that values the library and um, values what we bring to a community between education, uh, entertainment, gathering, and, uh, and um, local authors. So um, with uh, no further ado, I'm going to bring up Pamela Kime from Grand Tap Media um, to tell us a little bit about today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate all my friends that, that came today, and of course my wonderful husband, David. Uh, everybody, like everybody m might know that I used to do book dedications at the Grand Castle, and it was a wonderful um, library, but sadly, um, the person that built the Grand Castle passed away, and so new management. But I still enjoyed doing book dedications, and so when I met Terry uh, in her book, I asked Josh, and I said, you know what, can I just bring that platform over here? And here we are today. So thank you so much for being here, and thank you for everybody that has supported me today. All right, so I'm just going to move. I had this great speech um, laid out, and I've just decided today we're just it's such a beautiful day. Everybody wants to get going, and of course, everybody wants to ask Terry some questions, maybe about how she wrote her book during the pandemic when all of us were, some of us were panicking, such as myself, uh, during that time. And then of course, um, talk about the empty nest and then of course, any season. And I always tell people that maybe are going through the empty nest and they wanna hand that to somebody. I mean, just kind of, if you were a spouse, I would recommend just get, maybe getting it today if you know somebody that's going through it. The holidays are coming, it's a great gift. You might wanna just bring it home and just lay it on the coffee table, not so much. Here you go, honey, this might help you. As Christy Buck, um, I just interviewed her for mental health. Sometimes people go through seasons and they have struggles and they just want to just don't want to be bought, you know tell anybody they don't know who to tell and sometimes we find ourselves just talking to strangers about it because they're not emotionally involved when you're going through this and i wish terry's book was around when um my child graduated my youngest child graduated because i found myself at his school on graduation day crying in the parking lot it's not like I wasn't happy for my child and I wanted him to succeed. I just realized the season was over. Did I do everything right? Did I prepare my child for um, the world? And I was just kind of overwhelmed. And of course, we all might ask ourselves when we're in these seasons, it's like, now what? What do you do? So I want to introduce to you a dear friend now. Um, and we have known Terry for years. For us parents, she became part of our family when she did the bus stop weather. She helped us prepare our children for you know, their day. And of course, now she's gonna help us prepare our children when we need to let go and move on to the next season. So please welcome Terry DeBoer. start by telling you the journey of how this book came to be because I have always been a bookworm. Josh, you're going to be so happy because I I feel like the library is my home away from home. When I was a little girl, I grew up in Great Falls, Montana. My dad was in the Air Force, and when I was growing up, uh, my their big library was in downtown Great Falls, and if I didn't have anything going on on a Saturday, I'd ask my mom to drop me off at the library, and she would do that on a Saturday morning, and I would literally spend hours just roaming around the library, picking up books, and uh, fell in love with Encyclopedia Brown. I think that was my very first crush that I had, the boy detective, everybody remember the encyclopedia see I'm glad I'm in a room with people who are in my generation because you know who some of the younger ones may not know that 
Um, but I always had had a dream of writing a book. I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to have my own words in print on one of these shelves? And I wasn't really quite sure what I would write about. And so as my as I grew up and uh, fell in love, got married, started my family, had a busy career, I, I just felt like I lived my life in a whirlwind and started and stopped about a dozen manuscripts. Wasn't really sure what to write about. But I knew something about um, writing a compelling story, and it's that if you write from a, a point of pain, you are likely to not only help yourself, but you're likely to help someone else through a difficult time as well. And so I thought, at some point in my life, I'm going to hit this point of pain. And ironically, it was as my nest emptied and as my life started to settle that I began to search for a new purpose in life. And at that point, as I hit the empty nest season, I thought, this is the point that I'm going to write about. And uh, I wasn't quite sure how to start this literary journey for myself, because even though I had been someone who'd been a big consumer of books for my entire life, I'd never been a creator of literary content. So I had gone to a book signing in, uh, the, in the middle of 2019 and connected with someone who worked at a local publishing company, a locally based publishing company. And so in January of 2020, I took his card and uh, sent him an email and said, hey, I, I, would, I have this vision of writing a book. He was the senior vice president of Zondervan at the time. So we met for coffee in early February of 2020, and I told him my idea of writing a book for empty nesters. You see, I figured that I wasn't the only one who, when my nest emptied, found myself in the middle of the afternoon in my pajamas on the couch watching Hallmark movies, eating either a pint of ice cream or drinking a couple of glasses of wine <laughs> on alternating days. I felt like this really had to be something that was a, a part of the transition that a lot of us make. And so he said, you know, I really, I, I think that, you know, maybe you would have a great idea to write a book about the empty nest season. And so he said, but you better hurry because we're starting to hear that the world's about to shut down. And so, um, you know, the COVID pandemic in 2020 um, sort of accelerated a lot of things. So we met. I. Uh, I filled out and completed a book proposal, which for anyone who's ever been interested in writing a, a book, a book proposal is the equivalent of writing a 50-page research project about the book you want to write. And so the book proposal was not just an outline and synopsis of the book, but about all of the titles that are out there in the marketplace related to your book and um, your own ability and platform to market and sell books. And so finished the book proposal, sent it in to him early March, got the uh, invitation to come in and present to his team of uh, marketing VPs, and uh, ended up with a, a contract and offer to publish my book from Zondervan. And as a first time author, I thought, hey, this is like hitting the lottery. But the lottery is now 1.25 billion or something like that. So not quite that kind of a lottery, but you know, uh, I felt super excited. I was assigned an editor, a deadline, got a small advance. And uh, as the world was shutting down, I had two jobs in 2020. And that was to go to Wood TV and deliver the weather, and then to go home and plant myself in front of my laptop and uh, write the book. So as I was working through um, the book project, it, in fact, this library was an interesting stop for me in, as everything was shut down. The bookstores were shut down, the libraries were all shut down, and I needed a couple of books for resources, and I found them at this library. And so I would park out in one of those parking spots, and the ladies would run them out in a paper bag, and I thought, you know, this is an interesting transaction. Someone's bringing something in an empty, in a, in a blank paper bag out to my car to drop it off, sort of like a clandestine uh, kind of you know, <laughs> transaction. Um, but it worked out great. So my first draft of the book was due uh, the end of July 4th weekend. And uh, at the end of uh, probably the middle of June, I received a notification that my contact at Zondervan, um, his position had been eliminated and the local president 
of the company, his position had been eliminated. Uh, the book world was really suffering during COVID because they couldn't launch books, they um, couldn't tour with authors, they couldn't have book events, and it was just really simply, as a lot of businesses discovered, it was really hard to do business as usual during a pandemic. And so both of my contacts lost their jobs, but they assured me that uh, I should keep writing and that I should, that, that my deal was safe. So I finished the first draft of my, of my manuscript, sent it in to my editor. He had it for a month. I received his edits back early August of 2020. And a couple of days later, I received a uh, notification from the company that they were canceling 100 book contracts, including mine. <laughs> And so my lifelong dream of becoming a published author, signing a contract, finishing a manuscript, um, all of this then to discover that my contract had gone away. Now at the time, I had two thoughts. First of all, I felt like um, the, the two gentlemen who had helped me um, in the beginning, I was happy to reconnect with them. I knew they would be part of my new literary path. Um, I thought, you know, we, we took off on this plane together and we're gonna land it together. And um, it, I was able to, to complete the book with them. Um, and the second thought was there must be a, a different plan for the material that I was writing. I am a person of strong faith and I really felt like God just had a different plan and path for my book. And so I kept on working on the book and uh, at the end of the day I thought, you know what, a good book that is nonfiction about a journey needs a companion journal to go along with it. And so because I had to seek out a different kind of a publisher to uh, publish my book, I was able to launch the book and the journal at the exact same time. And so um, that's where you see Brighter Skies Ahead. I wasn't sure what the book would be called, and I certainly wasn't sure what the cover would look like. I didn't intend, in fact, for the book to um, have this beautiful cover. I, I wanted it to have a beautiful cover, don't get me wrong, but I, the cover I had imagined was more literal, bird, nest, tree, birds flying away. I mean, I really thought it would be literal. And then as um, I was working very closely with um, the designers at my new publisher, um, and they came up with a, a couple of options, I thought, you know, that just doesn't strike me as the tone for the book, because the, the book is, a, it's hopeful, upbeat, it's a journey to find the, who is the new you. And so as um, I started connecting with some friends, they, uh, and I was sharing my lament about, you know, I just don't know what the cover should look like on this book. And um, they said, you know, why don't you find someone who sort of matches the spirit of the book? And so um, that's how we ended up with this cover. And people ask, is that, you know, is that me on the cover? No, I sort of wish that I look like that from behind, but I don't. Um, is it one of my daughters? No, it, this is just a stock photo. And um, the truth is that um, I don't know who this woman is. I, I don't know her name, but I can tell you exactly who she is. She is a hopeful, energetic, optimistic woman who is looking to go on a new journey in life. And that's who I am and who I was as I was writing the book. And so I love the fact that her back is to us because what we see here is um, we don't know her expression. She could be laughing or smiling or sweating or crying. She could be happy or sad or angry. What we do know about her is that she is alone but looking out in the distance trying to find what would be her new adventure in life. And so that became, uh, you know, I, I love the cover. It's I really, when I saw it, I thought that's exactly it. Um, the book is 50 short chapters divided into nine sections, all about the different areas in our life, everything from our physical health to our mental health. Christy's been a dear friend for a long time. I've been a part of the Mental Health Foundation, and we know that um, our who we are emotionally and mentally is a big part of who we are as humans. Um, there's a, it, there's a whole uh, section about relationships with adult children, which can be really challenging as we um, see they become mm -hmm. adults, and our relationships with them have to change um, because we raised them to be independent 
and uh, self-reliant. And if we don't change how we view them as human beings, then our relationship with them can't possibly be the same as and as positive as it should be. Um, you know, one of my favorite chapters is the chapter about um, becoming a grandparent, which is a wonderful aspect of life when your kids are growing up and leaving the nest. And the, the biggest section is about my faith, the different areas of faith that change and evolve and deepen as we grow older together. And so if you will uh, indulge me a little, I will um, read to you one of my very favorite chapters here. I had a great time writing all of these, but um, there were a couple of them that I thought um, were just super fun. And uh, chapter five is called, uh, when you, is called What to Expect When You're Expecting to Empty the Nest. When you find out that you're pregnant for the first time, what to expect when you're expecting is considered a must read for every expectant mother. It is a week by week pregnancy guide written in 1984, a perennial best top selling book on the New York Times list, considered almost a pregnancy Bible. Who, raise your hand if you read this when you were, yes, or if you've given this as gifts, of course, yes, we have. The book, the book covers everything from morning sickness, fatigue, and stretch marks to moodiness, breast tenderness and frequent urination. Oh yes, it is definitely an all tell. It's packed with the information a pregnant woman would want to ask her sister, mother, best friend, or doctor. And uh, the book has pretty much every, has become this series of books. Everything you need to know just about not getting through that pregnancy, but um, guides that are called what to expect the first year, what to expect the second year, what to expect during the toddler years, what to eat when you're expecting, almost everything, right? But not what to expect when you are emptying the nest. And so I decided to take a little poetic license and I wrote these uh, ladies my own version of that chapter. And the first month of emptying the nest, um, weeks one and two, we start out with the feelings of sadness, separation, anxiety, and grief. And our behaviors are sudden crying, staring at family pictures for hours, lying in your child's bed, going to your child's closet, closing your eyes, and smelling the left behind clothing to get that familiar scent. Weeks three and four, our feelings. We're still sad, also loneliness and boredom slip in. Our behaviors, changing into PJs during the day, lying on the couch watching Hallmark movies, drinking your favorite wine in the middle of the day, or maybe eating a pint of ice cream. The second month, weeks one and two, not as sad. You miss the daily connections with your child. So your behaviors, you try to entice daily texting or phone calls with your child, and then plan to meet for dinner. Weeks three and four, feelings, not quite as sad. Boredom and loneliness take over as primary feelings. Behaviors, discover YouTube and enjoy daily video marathons. Third and fourth months, you realize the holiday season is just around the corner, so you get energized to start cleaning the house, organizing and decorating. Your feelings, excitement, energy and anticipation. Behaviors, plan Thanksgiving menu, enjoy Christmas shopping and wrapping the presents, tree decorating, planning menus, buying new games, stocking up on everyone's food and snacks that are their favorites. And then the fifth month sinks in. Hashtag see first month. <laughs> Weeks one, feelings, sadness, grief, separation anxiety returns for the second time. Behaviors, crying, hours spent looking at the holiday pictures, sitting on child's bed. Week two, feelings, Boredom, loneliness, behaviors, call friends to arrange activities, happy hours, movies, and shopping. Weeks three and four, feeling a little more energetic, behaviors, commit to a regular exercise routine. Sixth through ninth month, adjusting to fewer commitments and a less rigid schedule, feelings, freedom and flexibility, behaviors, accept invitations to attend events, schedule appointments. 10th through 12th month. Finishing the final months of the first year as an empty nester. Feelings. Proud of adjusting to a new daily normal. Anticipation for the future. Behaviors. Setting long-term goals. Plan a vacation. Take a class. 
finish a degree, giving birth to a new life. From the moment the plus sign shows up on a pregnancy test, new moms have many months to count down to the arrival of the new member of the family. They have months to prepare and plan for this new addition. Unfortunately, transitioning into an emptier nest is much more abrupt. One day your child is at home and suddenly that child moves away. It might take you 10 to 12 months to adjust to your new normal, but just like the birth of a new child, it will come in its own time. And so every chapter starts out with either a quote or a scripture verse, and every chapter ends with three questions to consider or daily activities. And um, the quote at the beginning of this chapter is from Irma Bombeck. Instead of wishing away nine months of pregnancy and complaining about the shadow over my feet, I'd have cherished every minute of it and, wondered, and realized that the wonderment growing inside of me was to be my only chance in life to assist God in a miracle. And so it was, um, it, it, for me, finding the right structure for the book was the important thing. And I, because I wanted so many different chapters and so many different topics, to someone can pick this up, sort of like a chicken soup for the soul book. Um, it felt like connecting with a, a quotation and finishing it with questions to consider would be a, a really good way to work through the different avenues and aspects of it. My, um, my other favorite chapter is the chapter that I wrote um, as I considered the different relationships in my life and especially the relationship that I had with my own parents when I was the one leaving, leaving them with the empty nest, realizing that there really was that almost full circle moment in that I, as the parent now, needed to reconnect with who I was as a young person when I was the one leaving the nest. And, um, this is chapter 37, it's called An Empty Nest Carol. I'm a huge fan of the Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol. There have been many modern remixes of this story using a modified plot line and modern day references and actors, but the overall story remains. So we talk a little bit about the outline of The Christmas Carol, and then I write about my own version of this story. Imagine your version of this classic story. Try to imagine ghostly visits to your past, present, and future. Who is your Jacob Marley? Who is your Tiny Tim? I have imagined my trip through this story where I travel through my past, present, and future from life after high school into the present day and then into the yet to come. My parents, especially my mom, represent the character Tiny Tim. A spirit of the past would take me to my life right after high school when I was launching out of my parents' nest and into adulthood, a visit to that time in my life makes my heart break over the fact that I left without staying in close connection. As I enter the empty nest season, I'm overwhelmed with the guilt in discovering how much my parents must have missed me and worried about me. This transition must have been even more difficult back then because there were no cell phones or social media, no texting. I certainly uh, didn't have the, with, with my youngest especially, I have the little Find My Friends app, so I know exactly where she is at any time of the day. My parents sadly didn't have that. Probably was a good thing back then. <laughs> but no texting, no FaceTime, no Facebook, Snapchat, or any other apps. Uh, this time travel exercise may give you some perspective and clarity about what's happening now with your own children. As I remember leaving my own parents' nest, it was only through the ignorance of their feelings and emotions that I was not closer with them. I was not looking to escape my parents as much as I was branching out to make my own way in the world. The distance, physical and other, was not because I was pushing away from them, it was because I was moving toward my own new life. And writing that chapter was very cathartic for me. It really gave me the opportunity to flip the script in my mind of why I could go days or sometimes weeks at a time without hearing from my adult children, but not that they were ignoring me. It was their life that we, I had raised them to embrace was filled with new 
memories and activities, and they were learning and growing on their own, not because they were trying to shut me out, but because they only had the capacity of having so much time. And so the book is filled with those little exercises, activities. It really is meant to be upbeat and, um, and hopeful and energetic. Uh, the journal, when I um, decided to, to write the journal, I, I separated it into three separate parts. The first part is um, there's a page to go along with every chapter in the book and writing prompts. Um, the second part, of the um, book is, uh, the, my book begins with me writing a letter to myself um, on my worst birthday. It was the year I turned 26. It was just a complete, it was, my life I thought was a train wreck at that point. Um, and so there was this Brad Paisley song a couple of years ago, a letter to me, where he wrote a letter to himself, not in, knowing, telling him his younger self what he wished he would have known about how his life was going to turn out. And so I took the opportunity to write a letter to myself to start the book. And so in um, the second part of the journal, I have um, different spaces for every decade of our lives to write a letter to ourselves. For some of us, um, it would be forward thinking. For some of them, it, of the decades, it would be backward thinking, uh, kind of looking back and reflecting on the past. And then the third section of this um, journal is I, I had some of my friends who are writers and who are community leaders um, write a, a short essay about why they write and why they think it's important to journal. And so it's, um, it's, an, it's an interesting journey through that. And I had a wonderful time writing that. And I'm glad the two of them were able to release at the same time. My third, I always envisioned the project as having three different pieces, the book, the journal, and then I wanted a devotional for empty nesters. And I was able to um, find a new publisher um, and went under contract to write that. And so um, that will be released in September of 2023. It's a 366-day devotional designed for empty nesters. So it's been a whole lot of fun. I am a little bummed, though. I feel like the um, my, my book left out an important section. And it was only um, because I wrote it at a time when I was still really going through the transition. Um, the section that leaves out is that um, the seasons in life as we name them in the book are the growing up season, the young adult season, sort of that juggling act season when all the kids are at home and uh, you have so much to do, there's not enough time in the day and you wonder how you're ever gonna get through it all. And then the last season I write about is called the empty nest season. And there's actually a new season that I've discovered and it's called, I'm calling it the encore season. That season that is about what is next for us after that what we think, or at least for decades, had been our season in life comes to an end. And so that's the next deep dive that I'm going into is writing about that um, promise of the encore season. I'm so excited that Jennifer's here from AARP because I know that AARP is um, really supportive and encouraging of that sort of next season in life. Research shows that about 10,000 Americans, I don't, I'm not sure if this is actually correct, 10,000 Americans a day retire. And for a lot of those people in their 50s and 60s, they still have a good 20 or 30 years of active life ahead of them. So what is that season of your life? Like There's one chapter in here about the encore season, um, but I really think that needs to be a whole project on its own. So let's see. Oh, oh good, we've got plenty of time. I, I also, this um, past year, um, finished another book about an entirely different concept, um, a different topic. As I was preparing to launch Brighter Skies Ahead, I had a meeting with uh, our friends at Faith Hospice. And um, I was going to be um, working with them on a project to help raise money for a new grief and bereavement center that they are, um, that they are building. And as I came into this meeting, the grief and bereavement manager, a lady named Janet Jamin, who was uh, a woman who was never married and never had kids, read my book from cover to cover, came into this meeting with notes, which I thought, you took notes on all of that. That's so impressive. Um, so, and she said, I read your book cover to cover and it is, your, your story is a journey of grief. When you finish a season, you come to the end of one part of life. 
um, that's a grief pro process that you're describing. And so she asked if I had ever considered, you know, doing anything about grief. And so she and I teamed up together and we wrote a book about the grieving process. And this is going to be released in uh, February of 2023. It's called Grieving Well, A Healing Season Through the Journey, A Healing Journey Through the Season of Grief. And um, our view on this uh, as we approached it was, you know, as, as a society, we really are about living well and we're about dying well, especially the, any hospice. If you have ever had someone you love go on a hospice journey, you know the people who work there are like angels among us. And they're about helping people die well. But we're not always about grieving well and who's left behind and what is that coming to a new normal in your life? What is that process like? And so it was um, really exciting to um, team up and write this book. And Jennifer, again, a contributor to the journal and a contributor with a beautiful essay in Grieving Well. And so um, look for that to be released in February of 2023. So Josh, I can tell you all of those uh, hours I spent for so many years of my life roaming around the library, not wasted hours, I guess, even though it took me decades to get inspired to actually write my first book. I can tell you that uh, this part of my life is really one that I am just in the beginning stages of. Does anyone have any questions or? Yes, Pamela. Oh, okay, well, I just wanted, many people want to write a book. Okay. Especially in the next season. Can you kind of, talk, kind of share a little bit about how we get started? Just yeah. any tips? So, um, so getting started writing a book, and it is, it's so fascinating because um, you have to figure out, um, first of all, you know, which path do you want to go, fiction or nonfiction? And then search for companies that write, that publish fiction and nonfiction. For most authors, especially people, and you know, unless you ha are a big name celebrity, you will need to have a representation in the form of an agent. If you wanted to go the traditional publishing route, that is. Um, not everybody goes the traditional publishing route, and honestly, if your goal is to um, get your book published and get it out into the world and make money doing it, you're probably going to want to self-publish or go the independent publishing route because most traditional publishers um, do not help authors sell books. Um, there are a lot of podcasts out there that um, are all about the writing process and the publishing process. And even authors who have been traditionally published and have sold lots and lots of books will almost without exception say, in today's world, they would self-publish instead of going with a traditional publisher. Um, an author does almost all of their own marketing and selling and um, if you go with a traditional publisher, if you're able to get a contract, it takes you, um, it can take a year and a half to two years from when you have your completed manuscript to actually get your book launched. Um, if you are going to be um, self-published or independent published, then you have a much shorter period of time because you're in control of your own destiny at that point. You can decide. Um, the most important investment I think you can make is, number one, having a good editor, finding an editor that you can work with who does a good job. Um, that was a part of, you know, I was very blessed because my first contract was with a traditional publisher, and I was equally blessed that that contract fell apart. And so then when I started looking for a new publisher, <laughs> I, did, I went through a hybrid publisher where it's a combination. Um, the hybrid publisher, I used was Morgan James. They have a whole um, design team and creative team that did the covers, did the layout, all of that, but the author's responsible for all of the editing. And so it's just a little bit of a different animal. Um, I, I know Christy um, has written a book with the Mental Health Foundation, Men, uh, Be Nice, and you independent published and it's been a huge success because they have control over their own product and it's used in conjunction with all of their teaching. So um, I had intended to do the devotional, um, doing that 
independent publishing or self-publishing, and then I received a, sort of an out-of-the-blue offer from a traditional publisher to do that project. So uh, I think that, um, and I don't know, I, I know, Josh, you probably have a bunch of resources here for authors, and I know that the Kent District Library System is so forward-thinking in encouraging writers that um, there's a series going on right now uh, about um, writing and publishing and really helping to encourage people to go on that journey. It's relatively inexpensive to write your own book, and um, it's, it's something that I, they say 80 to 85% of people would like to write a book at some point, and so um, I highly encourage you if you're interested in that. Um, help me to understand something. Um, your kids move out, and it's like all of a sudden you're depressed or down. Or does that, I mean, um, did you not like have any friends or anything? Just kind of hung around the house or nothing to do? Yeah, so, it, so it's interesting because, and, and I, see, I am so happy this is a mixed crowd because usually it's, it's mostly just women who totally get that point. Um, so to answer your question, I, um, so I have a career I love. I mean, I have just signed another contract at Wood TV that will take me to my 30 year anniversary there. So I have a career that I love. I do have great friends. I'm involved in the community. I'm on the board of directors for Christie. I'm on the Griffins Youth Foundation board of directors. I do a lot of volunteer work. Um, still married to my same husband after all these years, and we have, I would describe it as a pretty good relationship. Um, I have hobbies. I have a very full life. And so, but I was surprised that it hit me like a ton of bricks that I fell into this depression when my kids moved out. And the reason for that was because I had structured my whole life around doing all those things that I still had in my life, but then also I had these kids that were also very time consuming and very busy, and my kids never met a sport they didn't like. And so I it would end up, you know, from the time my alarm goes off at 2.30 in the morning until the time I collapsed into bed around 11 o'clock at night, go, 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 go. I'd never had the luxury of having free time or downtime, which is what all of a sudden I had when my nest emptied. And so um, as my kids uh, left, the, the time of the day that really was the toughest for me, um, just because of the way my schedule works, I go to work at 3.30 in the morning, but I'm, my work day is done between 11.30 and noon. And so the rest of the world is working then. My husband was working then, my um, friends, during the winter, the golf courses, you know, not open here. And so those afternoon hours were really the tough times for me. And um, that's where I really struggled and started to struggle. And it's interesting because as I, um, you know, a, as I went through that first whole year, you know, they say when you have a, a loss of something or when things dramatically change for you, if you get through the first whole year, then you, um, things tend to start improving because you get a whole new set of normal experiences. And, um, and that's really what happened to me, is that I was able to then find, uh, you know, different activities to do. I started walking a lot. Um, I will go for long walks. When I get home from work, I change my clothes, grab a snack, and I try to walk three to four miles a day. And that, to me, just gets my heart pumping, gets me out, um, communing with nature. I'm not exactly a huge fan of the snow and ice, so <laughs> that's a challenge. I uh, will tell you this, I'm only confessing this because we're in a room full of friends and, well, I know it's on TV. Um, I am a mall walker. <laughs> Raise your hand <laughs> if you're a mall walker, yes. Um, and I would go, it, well, I would alternate it between Rivertown and, um, and Woodland Mall. I would go back and forth and then I would just go, I would, I would take extra clothes to work and change my clothes at work and then I would go, if I was going to Woodland, especially on my way home from work and um, start walking around the mall. And then one day somebody said, oh, are you mall walking? And I don't know why I was so embarrassed about that. <laughs> it's like, uh, so, and so then anyway, I ended up 
buying something that I could get a bit in a big bag, and then I would put towels in that bag and leave it in my car so that when I went to the mall, it looked like I was shopping. <laughs> so anyway, but now I'm, I, I guess I should probably just make a t-shirt that says, yes, I'm a mall walker. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It is. A, see, now you're going to go to the mall in the afternoon, like, where is she? <laughs> hey, can I follow up with that? Okay, so you're home during the evening, you come home from work, okay, and you're on the couch eating your ice cream, watching all our Okay, so when your husband comes home, is it like the newlyweds again, where you jump in his arm, or are you laying there with a nice pack on your head? <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, yeah, it's like... Uh, well, the, the first couple of times he'd come home and I'm in my pajamas on the couch, you know, five o'clock, and he's like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> well, I don't know what's wrong with me, okay? It's okay if I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, but yeah, you know, and it's, uh, it, it just kind of depends. We, then we started binge watching shows together. You know, Netflix is really a great way to waste a lot of times. You know, I, I didn't even really realize all the great shows were, that were out there. So we started watching um, Suits, which was great, by the way. And then we came to the end of watching the however many seasons of Suits there were. And then we would make this joke, well, I guess that's the end of our marriage. And then I would go to work and say, ask the young people I work with, hey, anybody have a suggestion for another show that's sort of like Suits? White Collar, that was a good one. That's, that's a great series if you're looking for. Uh, and then we came to the end of White Collar. I guess that's the end of our marriage. And then uh, I think we started watching Scandal and then The Crown. So uh, anyway, and then um, during the, the summer months, obviously, we go and play golf and like to go out to eat a lot. Um, when, you know, and now it's uh, my, my kids, my two oldest live out of state. My son Jacob and his wife live in Seattle. Um, they don't have any kids yet, um, and my daughter Jacqueline and her husband Ben have my only son, grandson, Levi, and they're in Florida, and so I've been able to spend a decent amount of time going to Florida, and my husband and I yeah, last year bought a condo in uh, Clearwater, so that's been nice. I can go down and have Grammy time. My grandson calls me Grammy, which I love that. And then my youngest just finished a, um, her master's at Grand Valley, and um, just passed her real estate exam. So if you, if anybody's looking for a licensed realtor, Jen DeBoer, <laughs> five star. <laughs> There's the plug. There's the plug for you, honey. I told you I'd work it in there. So um, yes. So anybody else have any? I'm I'm gonna be around for a while. I do have a few copies of the book. Um, we're giving some away. We're gonna give some away. We're gonna have uh, Jennifer uh, from ARP. She's our presenting sponsor today. We want to thank her. I want to thank my husband. David, for being very supportive through all of this chaos when I when you plan an event, and of course the past events. All my friends that came that has been supporting me. Chris Huntoon, wherever he is, where are you at? Right there. You know, this is my camera guy, Tyler, WKTV, for being here. This is all being recorded. We're going to be able to use that. Michael, thank you for showing up. And some, some of my closest friends here, Colleen, is always with me. I just have to point somebody's out, Doc. And then, of course, Lisa and everyone else. All right, my dear friends, um, in the back there, I, I got to get moving on here. Okay, so we're going to invite Jennifer up. She's going to talk a little bit, give her a minute to talk about ARP, uh, because this is going to be the great opportunity when you're going into the empty nest, volunteer opportunities. She's got all kinds of things going on, and she includes me once in a while, and that's always wonderful. And then she's going to draw, and she's going to give away two sets of um, Terry's books. So you might be a winner today. So I want to welcome up Jennifer Firesign from our of Grand Rapids for being our presenting sponsor today. Thank you, my dear. Hello, everyone. So I'm Jennifer Firestein. I'm Associate State Director for AARP Michigan. I'm also an on-air personality uh, at WOTV4. And so Terry and I work together, and we've been friends for a long time. And we had a program at AARP called Life Reimagined. And it was about navigating the next step in life when you go through life transitions, whether it's retirement, empty nesting, losing somebody, whatever it is. And so Terry knew about that program, and so she approached me and said, I'm writing this book, and I want to find out if I could add some stuff about AARP in this and the Life Reimagined program, and could you do an endorsement of this? So I started reading through the book, and it hit me because I realized that I had gone through that stage of empty nesting without realizing that it was a true grieving process. My oldest son, Tyler, had gone off to college, and I remember the day so 
clearly I dropped him off at school at Michigan State at the time and drove home and I was a hot mess. I mean, I was sobbing and I called my lifelong friend and I was just beside myself. And it was like, where did this come from? I was not expecting it. It wasn't like he died. He was in Michigan State, he was an hour away. And it was like, I needed counseling to get through this. And I came home and I laid down on his bed and I cried and I wrote him a letter and I said, I wish that I could do it all over again because I wouldn't make you eat asparagus when you were a kid. <laughs> you hated asparagus and I made you eat it. And I just, I realized how fast that time had gone and he was now off to college. And now I have, a, my next son is a senior in high school. So we're going through the next step of becoming uh, you know, where he's leaving the nest, and then my daughter is a sophomore in high school. So I've got two that are right on the cusp of flying out of the nest, and uh, I'm kind of bracing myself because I know how hard that was just letting my oldest son go, and I still had two kids left at home. So it's going to be a whole lot different when they're all gone. So T I was telling Terry this story. We were having lunch, and I said, you know, I told her the story, and she said, well, I'm going to be doing the journal. Could you write that in the journal? And I said, absolutely. And so there's some part of my story in the journal of how I coped, how I got through it. And I wish that this type of book had been available when I was going through that because you just don't realize how difficult it is. And, uh, and so the book just really fits so perfectly with the work that we do at AARP. The chapter on re-careering, there's good information like Terry was identifying, like, you know, maybe in that empty nest stage of life, you decide you want to just do something completely different with your career. And so there's a lot of really helpful information in it. And uh, it's, a, it's a great book. And I look forward to reading the, uh, uh, the devotional that comes out. So I'm excited for that. And as you mentioned, um, the Gr Grieving Well book is another phenomenal one. Uh, I was, again, privileged to be able to write my own story in there about uh, death that I've experienced. And so she's just a very talented writer and is really filling a gap that did not exist with uh, having books and guides to help people through this transition of empty nesting. So anyways, thank you, Terry, for all that you do in West Michigan and for people now through this stage of life. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And I would like to say, even if, it's, if you're not empty nester, if you're thinking about a retirement, just, or you're going to have a transition, you just have to take out coworkers, and maybe you lost a loved one. And um, the devotional, I mean, the, the journal is a great way to get through that. As, as Christy Buck would say, you just bring, it helps you to bring that conversation to the dinner table. And then maybe as a couple, you just look at your life differently and do new things. So I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank Terry DeBoer. I want to thank Jennifer Firestein for being our presenting sponsor. I want to thank Josh, the library, for having. All my friends that came, I really appreciate it. But um, stick around, get a picture with Terry, and um, enjoy some coffee cake, and let's, t let's just connect. The opinions expressed in the preceding program are those of the producer and not necessarily those of WKTV Community Media.